So when we crafted this message, we, we, we were thinking about it being graduation day, our graduates from high school being here, uh, and, and we wanted to speak to uh, the identity that we have today. So that's kind of where we're going. Uh, I'm going to start with a question, though. Here's the question. Who tells you who you are? Who tells you who you are? Uh, but then there's a, another question that's probably equally as important. Who tells you who you're not? Who tells you who you aren't? I mean, we have this tendency to allow other people, to allow culture, to allow TV commercials, what we see on social media. Sometimes it's our boss. Sometimes it's our, quote, friends. And, and we la allow people to tell us who we are. And sometimes, here's what we do sometimes. Uh, maybe, maybe you've done this at po some point in your life. It's you. You decide who you are. You know, this is just who I am. I'm just, I might as well just live into it. This is who I am. You know, these are important questions because uh, from the time we are very young, from the time that we really start having the ability to think uh, somewhat for ourselves, until the last day we're here on this earth, we wrestle with these kind of questions. And they're questions that are about identity. They're about security. How secure are we on this earth? And they're about our significance while we are here. There are questions like this. Here, here are the questions. Like, who am I? Who am I really? Uh, where do I belong? Or another way to put it is, where do I fit in? What, what, is, what is my place here? The third one is, what am I supposed to do in this life while I am here? All of those have to do with identity, security, and significance. And here's the thing. From the very beginning, God has been trying to help us understand the answers to those questions. He, he's been telling us. He's been showing us. He's been calling us and pushing us and leading us to know the answers to those questions. Well, today's Mountain View, we're climbing mountains. We're going to climb Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai was the, the place where God and Moses met. You remember early on while the Israelites were coming out of Egypt and moving towards the Promised Land? This is where Moses went up on the the mountain and he received the Ten Commandments. We've seen the movie or we've seen the pictures of him with the tablets coming down. Some people say uh, that uh, Mount Sinai is in the Sinai Peninsula, down in the southern part of it. That's kind of where most historians think it is. Paul would say in the scriptures that it was in Arabia, so there's some confusion about that. But, but there was a definite mountain story that happened, and it's in Exodus 19. So if you have your Bibles with you, you want to follow along with me, it's Exodus 19, 1 through 9. We'll read that, and then we'll uh, get into the first couple of verses of 20. So would you stand as we honor God's word, please? Exactly two months. So here we are, two months from the time that Pharaoh said, okay, go, y'all leave. Exactly two months after the Israelites left Egypt, they arrived in the wilderness of Sinai. After breaking camp at Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and set up camp there at the base of Mount Sinai. Then Moses climbed the mountain. Here we go to appear before God. The Lord called to him from the mountain and said, give these instructions to the family of Jacob. That would be all of the Israelites gathered there. Announce it to the descendants of Israel. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. You know how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you will obey me and keep my commands, you will be my own special treasure from among all the peoples on earth. For all the earth belongs to me, and you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is the message you must give to the people of Israel. So Moses returned from the mountain and called together the elders of the people and told them everything the Lord had commanded him. And all the people responded together, we will do everything the Lord has commanded. So Moses brought the people's answer back to the Lord. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will come to you in a thick cloud, Moses, so the people themselves can hear me when I speak with you. Then they will always trust you. And then in chapter 20, just a couple of verses, 1, 2, and 3. Then the Lord gave the people all these instructions. I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You must not have any other God but me. 
So this is the Word of God. It's for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Now, if you read on in your Bible, you're going to see all the law, all the instructions that the Lord God gave to Moses on that mountain. And, and there's a lot. But we remember primarily because we were taught them early on, we remember the Ten Commandments. The first one was the one we just read. You must not have any other God but me. And, and so before they arrived at this mountain, here's what God was doing. He was trying to get them to understand that their identity would be in relationship to him. It would be because they are his children. It should not come from conforming to the culture around them. They were to be set apart from, different from all the other nations, all the other countries around them, set apart as God's own possession. So how do I know that? Because he's, he was trying to tell them that all along. When he appeared to Moses, you remember in the burning bush, before they get to Mount Sinai, before they come out of Egypt, you remember God appeared to Moses in the burning bush. Here's what he says to him in Exodus 3. So you'd have to go back earlier in this uh, book we just read. I have seen the oppression, look what he says, of my people, my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. And I, I just like, I like the idea that God's aware of our suffering. But he's, he's placing the label, the identity on the children of Israel. These are my people. These are my people. In fact, he, he tells him in, in verse 10 in that same chapter, he says, now I'm going to send you to Pharaoh and here's what you're going to do. You're going to lead my people Israel out of Egypt. And so he even told, he told uh, Moses and his brother Aaron what they would say to Pharaoh when they went to him to let my people go. Look what it says. It's in Exodus 5. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, let my people go so they may hold a festival in my honor in the wilderness. My people. These are my people. Here's what God wants. He wants his children to be known as his children. Isn't that what he's always wanted? But here's the problem. There's this immense pressure. Sometimes it is, it is overwhelming. There's this incredible pressure for us and for the Israelites to fit in, to, to make them conform to the culture around them. Uh, in Egypt, the Israelites were constantly bombarded with images of, of Egyptian gods, so-called gods, false gods, idols, and the Egyptian culture. And it, and it was what they grew up knowing. So you can imagine they lived in that culture. And this pressure to conform to that culture was strong. And sometimes it was too much for them to handle, and they caved in to it. Sound familiar? Does that sound like something that happens today? You know, delivering the Israelites, bringing them out of Egypt, and moving them to the promised land, it's really all about establishing that identity as children of God. Providing water when they had no water, when they were in the wilderness. Providing manna for them, the bread from heaven that came down because they were hungry and had nothing to eat. Then giving them quail so that they would have meat to eat. All of those things that God did was for the purpose of caring for them, providing for them, but also to show, demonstrate that these are my children. There is a trust relationship between the father and the children. You can imagine when people would run into some of those Israelites who had come out of Egypt and now they were in the promised land, and they would say, yeah, I'm an Israelite. And the foreigner might say to him, oh, you're, you're one of those that God gave water out of a rock, that God gave manna from heaven, whatever that is. God gave quail. You're, you're part of that group. That's who you are. You see the identity there? And so now they're here at Mount Sinai, and the law that God gives Moses for the Israelites was for the purpose of setting them apart, establishing that identity. Here's what, here's what it means. In, in the commandments, here's what God's saying. He's saying, these are my standards. You are my people, and I am your God. And this is what it looks like to be my people. It's about identity. But here's the problem. Have you ever talked about the pressure? Have you ever experienced the pressure to try to fit in? Man, the Israelites couldn't stand it. Moses was up on the mountain. It says, the Bible tells us, for 40 days, 40 nights. And these uh, Israelites, they couldn't stand it. They wanted a God like they had seen in Egypt that they could look at. So they, in essence, forced Aaron to help them build a golden calf. You remember that? 
And that's what happened there. And they began to worship this calf that was nothing but an idol, which leads me to the first lie that I want to talk to you about today. It's identity lie number one. I am not what I do. That's a lie. It's a lie. I like this quote I saw about lies. Look at this. Lies keep us in bondage. Truth sets us free, especially the truth about our identity. It's freeing. So, so let me share some truth that will set you free today. You are what you do. Yes, you are. I am too. We are what we do. If we act and live like a child of God, following Christ like he's asked us to, then our life reflects that, and people would be able to say, looking at you, oh, they're a child of God. That's somebody who believes in Jesus Christ and follows him. But the opposite is also true. The Israelites here and at other times, man, they faced an identity crisis. They were trying to figure it out, and they caved in, especially here with the golden calf. It's interesting that after they do that, God and Moses have this discussion up on the mountain because that God hears what's happening down below, and he says something to Moses about it. But here's what he does. Neither one of them want to claim the Israelites as their children anymore. Have you ever had a child who acted up and your spouse, uh, you, you said to your spouse, come get your child, they're acting up? It's your child, it's not my child? Debbie, Debbie and I do that now with our dogs. It's like if Murphy's acting up, Debbie's like, your, your dog is acting up. And if Mason acts up, the one that likes her so much, I'm like, your dog is messing up. It's your dog, it's not my dog. Well, that's exactly what happened in this discussion between Moses and God. Watch this, it's in Exodus 32. Look what it says. The Lord told Moses, quick, go down the mountain. These folks have been down there worshiping this golden calf. Your people, look at that. It's not God's people anymore. It's like your people, your people whom you brought from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. How quickly they have turned away from the way I commanded them to live. They've melted down gold and made it a calf, and they bowed down and sacrificed to it. They're saying, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. It's like, are you kidding me? After God had done all he had done, now they've got a golden calf. Then, look at verse 9. Then the Lord said, I have seen how stubborn and rebellious these people are. Now leave me alone so my fierce anger can blaze against them, and I'll destroy them. Then I will make you, Moses, into a great nation. It's like we're going to have a redo here. I'm going to destroy all of them. going to give you some new folks. You're going to be a great nation anyway, Moses. Look what Moses does. It's like, this is not my people. These are your people. But Moses tried to pacify the Lord his God. Oh, Lord, he said, why are you so angry with your own people? whom you brought from the land of Egypt with such great power and such a strong hand. Why let the Egyptians, whom we left, say their God rescued them with the evil intention of slaughtering them in the mountains and wiping them from the face of the earth? Turn away from your fierce angle, ang anger. Change your mind about this terrible disaster you have threatened against your people, your people. And he did. Praise the Lord, he did. Now, all God has ever wanted from the very beginning was for us to be his people, to be his people, to love him, to trust him, to worship him, to obey him, to follow him. That's all he's ever wanted. That's all he's ever wanted. But the reality is we are what we do. We are. But there's another lie you need to know. This is identity lie number two. And this is a big one. I am what others, I am who others say I am. And this is, this is so real. Uh, we buy into this lie often in our lives. And, and you've got to ask the question, why do, we, why do we listen to that? I mean, why do we listen to people who say things like this, like, you're, you're a failure. You know, you, you don't fit in here at all. You know, there's, there's something wrong with you. you. You'll never amount to anything. And, and then when, you, when it comes to your faith, there, there are voices out there saying this, and like, you know, you're wasting your time with that. Or God will never forgive you after what you've done. And we listen to these lies. I mean, there's one, one you might hear in the South, you'll say something like, you ain't right. Have you ever heard that one? You ain't right. Now, listen, there, there's sometimes when we do need to say that. But a lot of times it's a lie. It's a lie. And there's so many people walking around today that have bought into these lies. And, and, and those, these lies are usually whispered by Satan through people. And a lot of times, 
his family and friends and others who claim to be family and friends. And it's coming straight from the pit of hell. And here's the reality. We don't have to listen to them. We don't have to listen to them. We don't have to let others, the world, people around us, culture, social media, whatever it is, we don't have to let them tell us who we are. We don't. Because here's a truth you need to know this morning too. Truth sets you free, right? Identity truth number one. Only God gets to tell us who we are. Only God does. Not other people, not the world, not even the voices that we speak to ourselves. It's only God. And, and so that's why that truth, that's why God has spoken to us in such beautiful, loving ways in Scripture over and over again. When he says things like this, he'll say, he'll say it to Moses, I've called you by name. I've called you by name. I know your name. I know who you are. He'll say things like this, you are mine and I am yours. There's this relationship. We're, we're, we're one another's. He, he says something beautiful in the Old Testament. He says, I have carved your name in the palm of my hand. And I've hidden you in the shadow of my embrace. Man, do you, do you, hear, you hear the love in that? He, he says, you are my beloved. To be his beloved means that we are special to him, every single one of us. He says, on you, my favor rests. And I like the next one. He'll say, I delight in you and rejoice over you with singing. And I just think, you, you just, I don't know, maybe it's been, you've been around your kids or something, and they're, they're just, we're having a good time, and they're, they're happy, and they're playing, and, and it's almost like you're just humming. You're just like, man, life is good right now because I got my kids here. Everything is the way it should be. And I just imagine God doing that for us, that he's like singing over you. Oh, isn't that good? And then you can't miss the next one. Where, wherever you go, I go with you. There's no place you can go where he's not also there. And, and wherever, whenever you rest, wherever you rest, I'll keep watch. He's always watching over. The Bible says he neither sleeps nor slumbers. He doesn't. He's keeping watch. And, and the, the one that he spoke over Christ, he speaks over us as well. That is, you are my child in whom I am well pleased. And, you know, the Psalms, Brooks was talking about that, the music, Jamie's prayer. He is well pleased with us. We're his children. But there's so many who are living out of a lie today. This facade, this fake identity or false identity. And everybody else can see it except for us. Because we're trying so hard, so desperately to fit in with culture and those around us, to blend in so, so that we are part of the crowd. It was a problem with the Israelites. It's a problem today. It's a major problem today, and I fear it's getting worse. We let others tell us who we are. We strive our best to please humans and not please God. And we listen to the lies that the world speaks to us about us. And when we do, you know what I believe happens? I believe it breaks God's heart. I believe he might in one moment be up there singing over us and delighting in us. And the next moment it's like, oh, no, what, what, what happened to my child? Why, why would you do that? He says that in the Scripture. Paul says that to the early Christians. You know, Moses wanted the Israelites to find their true identity, too, in Christ. He gave them the law. He told them what the Lord said. But for Moses at times, it was a real struggle. If you read on, you'll see. In fact, there was one time when he, he actually asked the Lord to wipe him out, I believe. And he must have thought many times about quitting. But there was, there was this incredible thing that also happened on this mountain. Moses will ask the, ask the Lord to do something that is mind-boggling. Anybody remember what it was? He says, can, can I see your glory, Lord? Let me see your glory. Man, it's, a, it's a holy, beautiful moment on the mountain. Listen, it's in Exodus 33. You can read along with me. It begins in verse 12. Moses probably just worn out, and he knows he's got to lead the Israelites from this mountain into the promised land. And so look what he says. One day Moses said to the Lord, you've been telling me, take these people up to the promised land, but you haven't told me 
whom you will send with me. You've told me, I know you by name. There's that quote that God speaks over us. And I look favorably on you. My favor rests on you. If this is true, that you look favorably on me, let me know your ways so I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. And remember, he's going to remind him, these are your children. Remember that this nation is your very own people. And look what the Lord says. Man, I love this. I will, what's the next word? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. What's the next word? Personally. What does that mean? He's going himself. Don't you, don't you love that? He doesn't send an army of angels to go. He probably has them in the wings, so to speak, waiting if they're needed. He says, I'm going myself, the creator of everything that is. I personally will go with you. Moses calls him by name, and I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. Now watch what Moses says. If you don't go with me personally, don't make us leave this place. In other words, if you don't promise to go with me personally, I'm staying here, and so are all these people, because it's not worth going, at, going without you with us. How will anyone know that you look favorably on me and on me and your people if you don't go with us? Look at this verse, this next part of the verse. For your presence among us sets us apart. Sets your people and me apart from all other people on the earth. And then the Lord replied to Moses, I'll, I will indeed do what you've asked, for I look favorably on you, and I know you by name. Moses replied, then show me your glorious presence. And there was this moment. You need to read it. You need to pull it out and read it. Because what happens is God comes and walks by Moses. But he tells Moses, says, Moses, you're not going to be able to handle this, so, I, so you can't look at me directly. Here's what I'm going to do. Now, I'm going to hide you in the cleft of a rock, and I'm going to pass by, and you're going to see me at the very end as I go past. Isn't that good? Because God is so holy, so powerful, so mighty, that it would be too much for Moses to take in. He shows him his glory. And what he tells us here, I hope you're hearing it, is it's the presence of the Lord among us. That's it. That's what sets you and me apart from everybody else who's not a Christian in this world. It's what gives us our true identity. Moses knew that it was the Lord who gave him his identity and the security he wanted and the significance. And so for us today, it's Christ's presence with us. It's Christ's presence with us that sets us apart. Following him, becoming more like him, staying within the guardrails that he's given us for our conduct in this world. It's who he's called us to be, his children. And so when I embrace that identity in Christ, then that's what ultimately answers those questions I raised at the beginning, like who am I, where do I belong, and what am I to do in this life? There's the answer. But if we fail to embrace it, let me just tell you, we're in serious trouble. We are. Because there's going to be a day, believe it or not, friends, there's going to be a day when we stand before Jesus Christ. And, and he's probably going to say something to us like this. If we haven't been living into that identity, he's going to say, you missed who I wanted you to be in life because you conformed, because you fit in, because you went along with the culture. Or he's going to say, way to go. You became the person I wanted you to be. You were set apart from me all the days of your life. Well done. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud. So it matters. Now, I, I said this to the college students earlier. I said, you're going you're gonna to face immense pressure to fit in when you go off to college. Can I get an amen from anybody else here? I mean, you know, listen, I know a little bit about what I'm talking about here because I have a degree from the University of Georgia, from Mercer University, and from Emory. I've spent a little time on college campuses, uh, fraternity, the whole, the whole work. So here's the reality. You're going you're gonna to face a lot of pressure, friends. You are to blend in with the college culture. And some of that is good. You, you, you'll have some great times there, but a lot of it's not good. So, so here's our loving advice to you as your church, as your pastor. Listen, be careful. Be careful there. Because the moment you leave Christ's presence, the moment you decide to fit in and step out of who he's called you to be, that's the moment that you're in trouble and you're not living into the identity he has for you. 
But if you do, if you embrace it and you live into this identity, listen, it will eventually make your life better. And here's the beauty of it. And it will make you better at life, guaranteed. So there's your challenge. There, there, there's our day on the mountain with Moses today. And the question is, what are we going to do about it? Are we going to buy the lies or are we going to believe the truth that God gets to tell us who we are in our relationship with him? Well, here's some next steps for you this week to think about. Here's the first one. I will realize that I am what I do, good or bad, good or bad. I will not let the world tell me who I am. Listen, if you have been trying to fit in and conform, stop doing it. Just don't do it anymore. Don't give in to the pressure. Look, number three, I will not give in to the pressure to fit in. Number four, here's where you want to go. I will strive to live my life so that the world will know my identity as his child. It doesn't matter whether you're a high school graduate, a college graduate, uh, an adult. It doesn't matter. All of us have that choice to make. Well, let's pray if we could. Father, thank you Thank you that you are the one who gives us our identity. It's the truth. And thank you that you can deliver us from the lies that the world continues to shout at us, to get us to conform, to fit in, and to compromise who we know you want us to be. Help us to stand firm, to stand up, so that when it's all said and done, we can lift our, high, our heads high and say, you know what, I, I did it with your help, Lord. I lived my life as the person you wanted me to live. Didn't get it all right all the time. But I can stand here in confidence before you, Lord, and say, I believe I've done what you asked me to do. That's where we want to be with you one day, Lord. So help us to get there, um, and we'll thank you for it. Bless these graduates and their families and all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.